Welcome to Insights in History, a monthly program presented by the History Museum. My name is Marilyn Thompson and I'm the museum's marketing director. Now in its 18th year, Insights in History has featured over 180 different programs with a total attendance of over 13,500. Please join me in thanking the presenting sponsor of Insights in History, Tuesley Hall Canopa. Their generous support helps make this program possible. Hi, my name is Kristen Madden, and I'm the archivist at the History Museum. Welcome to Insights in History. In my presentation today, I will explore A League of Their Own, the 1992 film that immortalized the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. I will also highlight the differences between the film and the actual AAG PBL. Kelly Candell grew up hearing stories of his mother, Helen Callahan, and his aunt, Margaret Callahan's time playing in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Margaret and Helen, who grew up in Vancouver, Canada, were recruited after being spotted by a scout while they were playing in a tournament in the U.S. Helen and Margaret were both picked up by the Minneapolis Millerettes before Margaret went on to play for Fort Wayne, South Bend, Peoria, and Battle Creek. Helen played for Fort Wayne and Kenosha before retiring in 1949. In 1987, Kandel and Kim Wilson published a half an hour documentary called A League of Their Own, telling the story of Helen and Margaret and the many women who played in the league. Initially only broadcast on Los Angeles's local PBS channel, the film was eventually broadcast nationally. It was during this time that Penny Marshall saw the documentary and thought it would make a great film. She then spent the next five years, having done research and getting a good script put out, trying to sell the idea to movie execs. Kendall and Wilson were even asked to help write the treatment for the scripted film. Marshall and other film crew members toured Evansville, Huntington, and New Harmony, Indiana, and Henderson, Kentucky for use in the film before settling on Evansville for use as Racine, Wisconsin. The crew had initially wanted to use original park locations for filming, but many of the fields had either fallen into disrepair, been renovated to the extent of being unusable for a 1940s baseball field, or had been torn down by the time pre-production had begun. Robert Greenhut, the producer of the film, said casting took forever as they were trying to find actors who were athletic and knew how to play baseball, which greatly reduced the number of prospective actors. Many of them were made to go through a training camp for seven and a half months to better portray the characters on the field. In training, the actors used modern equipment such as pads and gloves. This led to an issue when filming began, and one of the actors injured her nose because she was unaccustomed to the older, less padded gloves from the 40s, which resulted in the ball slipping and hitting her in the nose. Many of the actors did their own stunts as well and showed they could be just as tough as the players during the league. Renee Coleman, who played Alice Gaspers, received the strawberry that is seen in the movie from sliding into base. Many claim she had that bruise for what felt like years. A generation of people learned about the AAG PBL through the movie. However, the movie does have some inaccuracies. Today, we're going to learn about some of the differences between the movie and the real All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Gary Marshall's character of Walter Harvey the Chocolate Tycoon is based off of Philip K. Wrigley of Wrigley Gum. Afraid that Major League Baseball would be shut down due to the war, Wrigley saw a huge amount of women taking over positions of men who were heading overseas and thought the league would be a great way to keep baseball alive in the U.S. Wrigley also saw an opening in the entertainment industry and believed that placing the teams in the Midwest would give smaller cities a chance at recreational opportunities only larger cities normally enjoyed. He believed the league would be a great way to boost the morale of the U.S. citizens by watching wholesome all-American girls, in albeit short skirts, playing America's pastime. 
Ira Lowenstein is based off Arthur Meyerhoff, Wrigley's advertising director, who took over running the league from 1945 to 1951. Wrigley had agreed to fund half the cost of operating and maintaining each team and all over budget expenses. The directors of each host city had to agree to pay the other half of the projected operating costs. Meyerhoff was given the responsibility of coordinating operations with city officials and civic leaders in the communities. Although making a promising debut in 1943, within two years Wrigley sold the league to Meyerhoff. Under his management, the league expanded to 12 teams and was reorganized so the franchise would be governed through a league board of directors with representatives from each franchise. He also partook in a large publicity campaign that peaked in 1948. The AAG PBL excelled in attendance and performance during the 1948 season, attracting 910,000 paying fans. After 1951, the league was owned by individuals or by players. Gina Davis's character, Dottie Henson, is inspired by real-life player Dottie Kamenchek, first baseman and outfielder. Kamenchek was considered one of the most feared players in the league, and Major League Baseball once called her the finest fielding first baseman, which included her male counterparts. Unlike Henson, Kamenchek played for 10 seasons and was selected for the all-star team the seven times the league had won. Dottie was even recruited for a men's team in Florida, though she turned them down because she thought they wanted her as a publicity stunt. In 1952, Kamenchek was sadly forced to retire due to a back injury, ending her career with a .292 batting average and having only been struck out 81 times. They'll pay you $75 a week. We only make 30 at the dairy. In the film, Kit is excited by the concept of receiving $75 a week while playing in the league, especially as the average person might have earned about half of that. In reality, the women of the league could have earned anywhere between $55 to $150 per week. Often the players made enough money to send part of their wages home to their families while saving the rest for when their time in professional baseball was over. A large number of women used their money to attend college, a feat they might not have been able to achieve had they not played in the league. Shirley Jamison, the second woman to sign up for the AAG PBL, recalled, At the time, I was teaching and my summer salary was more than I made teaching nine months a year. Spring training was set for May 17, 1943 at Wrigley Field in Chicago. All players stayed at the Belmont Hotel close to Wrigley Field. The final selection process for the teams began on the first day. League officials analyzed each player. They were tested on playing their field position, throwing, catching, running, sliding, and hitting. Those who survived the cut were signed to professional league contracts, which stated they were not to have any other employment during the baseball season. In the beginning of the film, during tryouts, the players can be seen throwing overhand. For the first three years of the league, the women played underhand and then switched to sidehand. Many of the pitchers found it difficult making this transition. Instead of trying to adapt to the new style of pitch, a number of players left to return to fast pitch softball or opted to play other positions. Those who decided to stay on as pitchers worked tirelessly to adjust to the new standard of play. Joanne Winter trained the whole offseason of 1948 with assistance from her coach to help transition to the new style. The league did start a large recruiting campaign to gain pitchers who already knew how to side pitch and then later overhand pitch. Sidehand pitching continued for three years until 1948 when they finally began to throw overhand. Another difference between the movie and history is that the women in the field can be seen playing on Major League Baseball sized fields. In reality, teams played on fields closer to softball sizes, though the length between bases did grow over time. By the end of the league's existence, the baselines were five feet shorter than major league fields. One of the more subtle differences that has ended up a rather major error, especially in merchandising, is logos. The two team patches that are correct in the movie are that of the Rockford Peaches and the Racine Bells. Quite often, if you search online, you will find the South Bend Blue Sox logo is that of a profile of a Native American in a headdress. 
That patch was actually the logo of the Peoria Red Wings. The Blue Sox logo was South Bend's city flag for many years before changing to a baseball with the name inside. The patches worn on the arms of the uniforms in the film have the logo of AAG PBL. The league was not actually called that until 1987. In 1943, the league was first called the AAG SBL, the All-American Girls Softball League. And then in the second half of 1943, it was the AAG BBL, the All-American Girls Baseball League, to make it distinctive from the existing softball leagues and because the rules of play were those of Major League Baseball. However, the retention of shorter infield distances and underhand pitching caused some controversy in the media about baseball in the league name. At the end of practice today, you all have to get fitted for your uniform. And this is what they're going to look like. Pretty darn nippy, if you ask me. How about that, Billy? You can't slide in that. Hey, that's a dress. It's half a dress. Excuse me, that's not a baseball uniform. Yeah, what do you think we are, ball players or ballerinas? That's <laughs> a short. Short? I'm going to have to squat in that thing. Once the women had been chosen to participate in the league, they were shown what their uniforms were to look like. Mrs. Harvey, in reality Mrs. Wrigley, and a team of clothing designers came up with a uniform that was meant to be both functional and feminine. This resulted in a dress with silk bloomers underneath. Many were not thrilled with the concept of having to wear skirts out on the field, finding them less than functional at the best of times. With no fabric to protect them during slides, many women found themselves with strawberries on their legs. Running was also difficult with the fabric from the skirts dragging behind them. In the first few years, when balls were still thrown underhand, pitchers often found their arms getting caught on their skirts. Many players took to secretly altering their uniforms to allow them to play more easily, taking in the size of their skirts and often raising hemlines, some to the point where their shorts could be seen underneath. Charm school was a legitimate requirement for the women participating in the league. In 1944, spring training was held in Peru, Illinois, and Ruth Tiffany School was contracted to run the nightly classes. The emphasis was to make bright stars of each player by integrating a healthy mind and healthy body. The arts of walking, sitting, speaking, selecting clothes, applying makeup, and social skills were part of the program. Wrigley expected each woman to project the all-American girl next door look while performing feats of outstanding athletic prowess on the field. They were not allowed to wear pants in public and were required to have a certain makeup and fitness regime. While some of the players appreciated their time in classes, others felt it was a waste and believed that it took away from them being respected as real ball players. In the film, Marla Hooch, played by Megan Cavanaugh, was originally not going to be recruited because she was not considered pretty enough. The players were required to fit within a certain beauty standard and women were known to have been cut if they did not fit it. Despite being an all-star player, Josephine Jojo D'Angelo was supposedly cut from the Blue Sox for getting a haircut deemed too short. For those who were concerned about their respectability on the field, Charm School was canceled after Wrigley left the league in 1944. Though initially met with some apprehensions, the AAG PBL premiered in 1943 with much fanfare in host cities and quickly put to rest some concerns about their athletic abilities. In the South Bend Tribune, dated May 30, 1943, pregame ceremonies will start the league's South Bend premiere. There will be music, a parade of the players of the two teams, which will wind up with them forming a V near home plate as the flag is raised to the strains of the Star Spangled Banner. Jim Coston, a reporter for the Tribune, wrote on May 31, 1943, those who never before had seen two teams of expert girls softball players tangling with each other were quite agreeably surprised at the artistry displayed by the feminine athletes. In the film, the players were frequently depicted at staying at various hotels during the season. In reality, in team cities, league officials arranged to have groups of players rent rooms from families whose houses were within walking distance of the ballpark. 
Living in people's homes helped ease the way for homesick players and provided some degree of supervision for younger ones. Chaperones had to approve all host families and players needed their chaperones permission if they wanted to change homes. During the war, teams did not have buses of their own due to gas rationing. Players were forced to take the trains from game to game. Once rationing was over, they were allowed to charter their own buses, which allowed the players some privacy and comfort. One of the comedic moments in the film is when the women play some rather nasty tricks on their chaperone, Miss Cuthbert, like when they put poison in her food, making her ill so that they could go to a dance hall. In reality, the players and chaperones were on a much friendlier basis. Although the girls may have played a trick or two on chaperones, like putting salt in their bedsheets, there was never any ill will. Chaperones were responsible for keeping the well-being and morals of the players intact. They often accompanied players on dates and even interviewed prospective beaux. The women also served at times as parental figures and were known for keeping an eye on the younger players on the teams. Dottie Schroeder was only 15 when she started with the South Bend Blue Sox. Toward the end of the league, many players had gone on to become chaperones or even coaches and co-owners for different teams. The scene where the African-American woman throws the ball over Dottie's head was a small nod to the fact that although there were many women from Canada and Cuba in the league, African-Americans were not yet allowed to play in Major League games. It wasn't until 1947 that the Major League introduced their first African-American player, Jackie Robinson. In November of 1951, the league's board of directors debated the issue of integration at length. According to the minutes of the meeting, the consensus of the group seemed to be against the idea of colored players, unless they would show promise of exceptional ability. The directors added that if anyone did hire an African-American player, none of the clubs would make her feel unwelcome. Many players did end up playing against African-American women in exhibition games outside of the league. Some would be able to claim they had even gone up against Mammy Johnson, the first African-American woman to join the Negro Leagues. Johnson did try to attend tryouts for the league in 1952, but was unfortunately turned down. In the film, where they have a movie tone video, one of the peaches stops to powder her nose. This was inspired by a photo of Anne O'Dowd and Beverly Hatzell applying makeup on the field. Many former players were used as consultants on the film and were even invited to appear as extras at the end. The shot of Rosie O'Donnell's character Doris throwing two balls in one hand to two other players was taught to her by the real player who did it. Dolores Pickles Lee Drives was known for being able to throw two balls in one hand and was a featured pregame entertainment numerous times in her career. What is accurate in both movie and real life was how sports announcers frequently portrayed the players. Many announcers were men who had never spoken about women's sports before and often spent more time speaking on the women's femininity than their actual playing prowess. At times when players complained about announcers, the men would become aggravated and then exclusively comment on the player's size and shape. However, many announcers and sports writers did enjoy the AAG PBL and reflected their love of the game with such things like parodies of poems. On July 7, 1945, Annabelle Lefty Lee, a Fort Wayne Daisy pitcher, pitched nine innings of no-hit, no-run ball against the Grand Rapids Chicks. Three days later, a Grand Rapids reporter named K.C. Clapp made a parody of Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Annabelle Lee. Part of the poem included, She was not wild, this talented child, so twirled so effectively, and no free passes were handed out by the stingy Annabelle Lee. So they sharply dropped from second spot to a humble berth in three, but Fort Wayne cheers its peach-clad deers because of Annabelle Lee. Evelyn Gardner, played by Elizabeth Schramm, comes up with the AAG PBL victory song in the film. In real life, Nalda Bird, who played for South Bend in 1945, co-authored the victory song with LaVon Pepper Pear Davis. Today, it is fairly common to hear the song being sung out at one of the players' reunions. 
Although there were not any Stillwells running around on the teams, managers did have to worry about the possibility of their players becoming pregnant during the season. Dottie Collins, pitcher for the Fort Wayne Daisies, ended up pitching in the summer of 1948 until she was four months pregnant. Besides her family and doctor, only her manager, Dick Bass, and her catcher, Mary Roundtree, knew. Both later admitted to being worried for her and tried to figure out ways to keep both her and her baby safe. Her doctor had cleared her to play, telling Collins that she would know when it was time to stop. She did, and on August 1, 1948, after the first game of a doubleheader against the Peoria Red Wings, with a 13-8 record and 2.01 earned run average, Collins took a leave of absence from the league. Dottie's first child, a daughter named Patricia, was born on December 22, 1948. Little Patty Collins did attend her mother's games when she returned to pitching, but in the care of her father and grandmother. Kit is known in the film for competitiveness, which culminates in the climatic ending scene where she runs her sister Dottie over to win the game. In real life, some players were just as aggressive as Kit. There were many stories of players doing such things as kicking dirt at umpires when they felt a call was poorly made, but some took it to another level. Pepper Pear Davis knocked down Lou Reimkiss, an imposing future all-pro football player who was moonlighting as an umpire at the time. Sliding in at second, Davis whirled around to protest Reimkiss's call and claims her fist inadvertently caught him in the jaw. The umpire ended up flat on his back. Reimkiss and Davis both knew she'd be sitting out the rest of the game that day. In 1947, Ruth Tex Lessing, catcher for Fort Wayne, was involved in an argument with umpire George Johnson. In a game against the Racine Bells, Lessing punched Johnson to the ground because of a disagreement with the umpire's strike zone. The AAG PBL fined her $100. Grand Rapids fans began to send in donations to pay for her fine, eventually topping out at $2,000. Lessing paid the fine and asked that the money raised be given to charity. She later wrote a letter of apology to Johnson, who accepted it, and afterwards the two became friends. The final game where Rockford and Racine battled it out for the championship had one tiny error in it. That error being, the Peaches didn't actually play in the championship that year. The Racine Bells played the Kenosha Comets for the championship. In fact, the Rockford Peaches came in last that year but they did go on to win the championship in 1945, 48, 49, and 50. The Journal Times in Racine, Wisconsin wrote on September 7, 1943, Dorothy Wind whipped the ball to Marnie Downhauser for the final put out on Sunday afternoon's game at Horlick Field and a crowd of 3,362 roaringly happy fans rose to acclaim the Racine Bells 6-3 winner over the Kenosha Comets, the first recognized world champions of girls' professional softball. The fans had reason to howl with delight for the Bells in sweeping the series, had proved beyond all doubt that they were the class of the All-American Girls Softball League as they out-hit, out-ran, out-fielded, and outsmarted the Comets. In the final game, they had come from behind once and broken a tie score in the eighth inning to grab the third and deciding game. On November 10, 1943, the Journal Times also wrote, Members of the Racine Bells team, winners of the All-American Girls League Championship in its first season of competition, have received a solid gold emblem signifying participation with the winning team in the first professional World Series for girls teams. Each player on the winning team received $228.31, as did the manager and chaperone. In the scene where the retired players are out in the field playing and two people talk about Dottie, it is mentioned she only played for one season and was ostensibly forgotten by everyone except those who played with her. Many women only played for one or two seasons, sometimes even part of a season before retiring from the game. Sometimes for injuries, sometimes like Dottie, their husbands came home from war. Frida Acker was recruited to the South Bend Blue Sox in 1947 and joined them in Havana, Cuba for spring training. Acker played in a few exhibition games on the way home from training but never participated in any league games and was removed from the roster shortly after the season began. 
Thank you for joining me today. This presentation has been a part of our Insights in History series, a monthly program at the History Museum. See you next time.